and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Well, hello, folks. Welcome to Through a Scottish Prism. Uh, I'm glad you could join us today. Sorry about a wee bit late. Some technical problems, but we're working on them. Uh, I'm glad to say I'm, I'm joined by Denise. Um, and we're here to have a wee chat about the weekly events. How are you, Denise? Oh, fine, thank you. Good, glad to hear it. What have you been up to? Um, yeah, working, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've been reading a lot of the blogs that we've been that have been put out, and uh, trying to guide and gauge the mood of the independence movement at this time, uh, which I feel is very flat and very despondent. Yeah. So I, I, it has to me a little bit of a feeling of ninety two about it. You know, when the Tories won a majority and everybody expected Labour was going to win, and everybody was like, the Tory government was tired. It limped through five years, crisis after crisis, ended up Labour landslide, and it just has that kind of feeling about it. A government out of ideas no prospects whatsoever of an independence referendum. They've already kicked it to the second half of the parliament uh, after they get another mandate in the Westminster general election. And the chance of a independence in this five years is gone. There's no chance of it whatsoever. No. And I think it's kind of filtering through to people. Uh, there's, it's, it's not going to happen. So now we've got a government and the new cabinet of like very, Katie Forbes, accepting Katie Forbes, who is very good. The rest of them are pretty much, you know, um, well, I can't really think of the correct word, but they're underwhelming, shall we say. There are people that have failed in the past, Shirley Ann Somerville, for example, in education. Which so we'll there, discuss later in yeah. the, uh, the show. So we shouldn't yeah. go too far down that one just yeah. now. Um, it's... Uh, it's been quite a week. I mean, this is another thing. Did you know in the parliament we have a baroness? Yeah, exactly. A Labour baroness. Yeah. Uh, Very uh, socialist. Yeah. <laughs> but that's Labour for you. You know, yeah. they, they promised to abolish the House of Lords, but they go into the House of Lords. And it, you know, it seems to be like a contradiction in terms. A Labour, a Lord, Lord Socialist, a Socialist Lord. Uh, they're just sellouts. Uh, there's a quote that I always think of when I see them in their airmine, and it's like, what shall it profit the man, a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? And I think the Labour, every single Labour person that accepted a peerage have lost their own soul. So I feel pity for them, actually. Mm. <laughs> They've sold out their principles yeah. for a little bit of, you know. Quite some time ago. Yeah. Um, um, we've also had one... Stickergate in Kirkcaldy. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, but again, it is a chilling effect. It's an attack on free expression. To have the police put out a tweet about controversial stickers and then say they're investing it, gating it as a hate crime. We know during the pandemic, it's not been possible to have political protests and political protests is a right. And therefore stickers, chalk, haberdashery um, is the only means of political protest. And yet now we have the police basically making an attack on free expression, a, a chilling effect on free expression and political protest by putting out these kind of tweets. And then, of course, we have uh, Marion Miller, who is now being char uh, threatened with being charged uh, for a tweet, but she doesn't even know what tweet it is. It's ridiculous. And, and the worst, the thing about it is it's going to get worse because the Hate Crimes Act is not law yet. Once the Hate Crimes Act comes law, it will actually get worse. Well, well welcome in. Better late than never. Yes, there was a technological difficulty mm -hmm. once again surrounding Renfrewshire. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure the full resources of the Scottish Government were employed. Well, it could be the GCHQ, though. You never know. It could. It could. Uh, well, just to Marianne Miller, 
Yes, yes, I'm, I'm aware of that case. I believe she's been interviewed again the 27th of May, I think, uh, from uh, my recall. It's just the latest in a long uh, list of persecutions. I've been spending most of this week trying to find out more about uh, Dave's problems through in Edinburgh, which are just quite unbelievable. I mean, it's it's getting to ludicrous levels. I mean, uh, I'm sure if you uh, say anything to anyone now, it can be construed as being in some way a threat or whatever. These fragile people out there who have no problem throwing abuse at everyone else. But if someone returns uh, even a slight smidgen of criticism, uh, they want to take them to court. It's happening all over the country. There was a man cleared the Nobin uh, court the other week there uh, for a similar involving uh, a, per a person from Nicholas Close team of advisors in COVID uh, who is being persecuted, found completely not guilty, but out tens of thousands of pounds in legal costs to defend himself quite unnecessarily. I mean, it, it's ridiculous and it has to end. And I like Denise's article uh, today, which I read, uh, and uh, I've got my own views on similar matters coming tomorrow, but uh, we need to go on the attack on yeah. this. There is no way uh, they, they can be allowed to continue misusing the law and the prosecution services in the way that they are. It's quite outrageous and it needs tackled. And, you know, uh, I'm serious, giving serious thought to writing out what my policy will be if and when they come for me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to publicise it so folk know what my reaction to it will be. Now, whether that intimidates them into not coming for me or, or not, but it will be public what I intend to do if such a situation. It's okay for you, Roddy, sitting out there in Catalonia, you know, outside the jurisdiction, you know, but there's, there's small targets like myself who clearly might be at risk uh, if we continue to be critical of Her Majesty's Scottish Government. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of and case Her Majesty, of a lady in Waterstones who was complaining about a book, Material Girl, wanted it taken down. She was offended, upset, hurt. Unbelievable. Books, what's next? Burning them? Well, I, I was suggesting people should have a look at what they call you and me, Roddy. I mean, uh, anything that's so far made court, uh, we can easily do with some examples from our own pages from some of uh, Nicholas' supporters. I think the problem with the hate crimes bill when it comes into law is it doesn't protect women from misogynist abuse, but it does protect, it does um, give extremists, um, you know, the ability to report women to the police if women try and defend their sex-based rights. And therefore, it's an unequal battle because they can call women TERFs and other terms of um, abuse. I mean, I've been called the C word um, plenty of times and uh, we, can't, um, we can't report that because misogyny is not covered in the hate crimes bill. But if a woman is just to write a tweet defending her sex-based rights, it can be reported and all it takes is for a police person to take the 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 um words seriously and Humza Yusuf had an opportunity to clarify in his bill what is and isn't he with it. Joanne Lamont put an amendment forward and of course as with all the other amendments that might have possibly protected women Humza Yusuf rejected it it is a misogynist bill the hate crimes bill it is against women and it's coming into law so what we've seen so far is with the existing laws what it's going to be even worse when yeah. hate crime comes in and i do agree that living in scotland is dangerous for anyone with an opinion that doesn't fit with the prevailing orthodoxy and what we do about it we take a risk yeah, well, I mean, people have, you know, I mean, I've got a background of living in countries where freedom was 
completely extinguished for almost 50 years. And, you know, parents had to be careful what they said to their children in their own home because uh, when their children went to school, they were being questioned by the teacher about the conversations they had with their parents. Now, I've got absolutely no wish at all to see anything like that coming here in Scotland. In fact, if you'd said to me five years ago that there was even a threat of it, I would have called you, you know, know. probably a name that got me in court nowadays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, to me, it's just absolutely outrageous. I never thought it would happen in Scotland. I most certainly never thought that the threat would be coming from the Scottish National Party. But what we're looking at is fascist tactics. Now, yes. you know, you can disguise it in any way you want with other adjectives. But at the end of the day, the tactics that have been employed are fascist tactics. They're seeking to create fear, intimidate people from having an opinion about measures which, quite frankly, are scandalous. And I would say to anyone listening to this programme, hang on, uh, there's a piece coming towards the end of this programme that will outrage you, that will shock you. And I hope it does, because it needs to happen. Folk need to know what we're talking about here. Folk need to know how deep it's ingrained into the behaviour and acceptance of the people at the very top of the Scottish Government. And we're going to reveal in this programme today just how far it's gone. And I hope the reaction to it is enormous. Yeah, I'm hoping it will too. Um, as you say, we'll be discussing it later in the pro in the program. I'm having some sound difficulties. <laughs> I don't know if they're coming across. Um, can you all hear me? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Barely. Barely. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Let's try that. I don't know. Anyway, something also concerning this week was the SRP leader. Hey, can you put up the slide, Techie? Here it comes. Um, and you can see that some members of the park are already sort of reading us for a pushback on the referendum date into the second half of the parliament. Post 2024. Not encouraging. But but entirely expected. This was always going to happen before the referendum, before the election. I think they were already, you know, rolling back because they, they knew they could. They they didn't go into the election in May saying we're having a referendum for sure this term. It was very qualified when COVID is over, we'll ask for a Section 30. And then if it's refused, we will um, put through a referendum bill. None of that's having a referendum. None of that's getting independence. This is just, just the usual carrots um, for the masses so that they would vote for them. The pretense of the SNP being an independence party. I don't consider it an independence party anymore. I consider it a barrier to independence because it's fooling people into voting for SNP, the people that think it will be independence. And it's not, it's not delivering independence. It's seven years, they've got another five years. That will be 12 years Nicola will have been in power and not delivered anything and not put anything made any progress whatsoever towards independence no policies no money <laughs> you know the no no legal certainty no progress no no route so why we're continuing you know so we're in a kind of very bad situation at the moment we've got five years of stagnation in fact worse we're going to go backwards because westminster is in the ascendancy they're going to be on the attack and we've got a pitifully weak cabinet and government and parliament that will be incapable of fighting off westminster because they're they haven't got the fight they haven't got the strength they are too weak and yep. unfortunately, sad. that's where Scotland stands today. Yep. Well, I mean, it's deliberate. I mean, they're making it as difficult as possible, intentionally. It'd probably be easier to teach a horse to play the piano 
than it would be to get a referendum under the SNP. I mean, they are out, going out of their way to put obstacle after obstacle, yes. to talk in code. Because you're right, Denise, I mean, all the things they talk about that give the impression of action are not. It's an impression of maybe starting to take some action. It's nowhere near having a referendum or going for independence. Now, what does it mean when the COVID crisis has passed? Does that mean the actual illness or does she mean the economic fallout? What does she well, mean? I mean, the pandemic's going to be with us, the, the disease, you know, perhaps not at these levels, but certainly it's going to be about for years. But I think it's worse than that because I don't think they're just talking about the disease itself. I think they're talking about the economic consequences. And that can be as long as a piece of string. They can that, string that out. Yeah. I mean, some economists say it'll take a decade yeah. or more. But, but that's what you're saying. That the the primary words, we, we don't know what they actually mean. Do, as I say, do they mean when the illness is over? Do they mean when the economic uh, crisis is over? It is her primary words again. Yeah, so they can say, well, I never actually said that. And, oh, just wait. Yeah, you know, it's still yeah. carrot. Yeah, yeah. But it's just an excuse. They, it could have been anything. You know, first it was Brexit. We needed to, first we were going to have a choice before Brexit, then when the terms of Brexit were known. Now it's like, oh, well, we couldn't do it because of COVID. And now it's when the COVID crisis is over. It's just an excuse after excuse after excuse. And they would grab onto any excuse. So they have no intentions of having a referendum. They have no intentions of getting us independence, none. And people just need to realise that. The only reason they talk about independence is to get the votes, because they can rely on the independence vote to keep them in power. Their interest is power, staying in power. They're not interested in independence. Yeah. Whether they, they, if you think about Nicola Sturgeon and you think about some of the people in her cabinet, you must realise that they're not in a position to act against the British state. Yeah. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon is not in a position where she could act against the British state. She does as she is told. Hmm. And she has been doing that at least since 2017. Now, and what we are seeing is that the, the SNP faithful are still, even after the battle was being won, they're still attacking Alba and blaming them because they didn't get a huge majority or they didn't get a super majority. They told everyone they would get um, if they voted SNP 1-2. Um, and they're still attacking ALBA, which is ridiculous. But ALBA is the, the only hope for independence. So if you are against independence, you're going to attack ALBA. And it seems very strange that the people attacking ALBA are the SNP. It's not the unionists. The unionists are sitting back and letting the SNP do their dirty work the same way as the Tories let Labour do the dirty work in the referendum. So ALBA will be under constant attack and also they will be not just from the SNP but from the press and the SNP and the press collude together. So that's the situation we're in. We've got a small party growing that we need to grow into the independence party because in, SNP is no longer the independence party. Well, I mean, they we made a great, they, the independence party, we're finished. <laughs> well, they, they made a great effort after the election to kill off Alba mm -hmm. because they recognise what a danger it's going to be as they carry on with this hate crime bill, with this legislation, with the plans to introduce the sex education mm -hmm. classes into schools. You know, people know from the last election they can't rely on Labour, the Tories, the Greens, the Liberals to say a word about it. Yeah. Yeah, only exactly. Alba, only Alba will say, and people say, well, you know, what relevance will Alba have in the council elections? Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you, it's the council, uh, councils that run the education in every area of Scotland. And if there's a strong Alba presence saying, not here, you're not going to do that here then there'll be a lot of support for ALBA and ALBA will have a role. So that's why, I mean, the SNP aren't daft. They know that's the case. That's why they try so desperately to kill off ALBA to snow because they know our day is coming mm -hmm. and they want to do their best not to face that challenge. Uh, and indeed they do. And it's, uh, 
But that's why it's so important that this forum and every other forum that's pro-independence needs to keep fighting and speaking up and telling the truth. And one of the things we talked about in our first show um, was the Scottish Free Media. And uh, we've got together a group of people who are going to keep carrying the message of Scottish independence for as long as is possible. And I'm going to every week introduce a couple of these people. We can't have them all on at once. We thought about that, but it's just not possible. So, Denise, can I thank you temporarily because we're getting back in shortly. I'm going to bring in two new guests to introduce to the public. And uh, with our, our technical people, who will hopefully just ease them in now. Here we go. Karen, I welcome Hello. firstly Karen Kelly of We Detour. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I'm Keep good. my mischief? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try. I'll Not try. like you. Not like no. you. <laughs> welcome to the to Through a Scottish Prism again. Karen. You've, you've been here before. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, and, yeah. And with any luck, we're about to be joined as well by Jaggy Blog. As we just wait, maybe not. Anyway, what have you been up to? You've been writing some great stuff this week. What do you do? Yeah, every week? <laughs> I know. Um, I've been kind of see. I'm putting myself out there, and I'm kind of putting myself in danger a wee bit because I think somebody's going to be. You know, it's time for us to be brave and, and get in there. It's it's not like say if they tweet something, get in there and and have your opinion because it's not what they're tweeting; it's the comments. So that people see an alternative, you know, like a, a, an alternative mind to what's going on. Um, so I kind of I try to stick to writing like on a Tuesday and a Thursday because obviously I'm I'm busy as well. Um, so I kind of wrote like you know, f f f Nicola, if we start to finish on Tuesday, and then I wrote the dangling of the carrots um, on Thursday. You know, the outcome the carrots. She's got quite a, a, a number of them now that she, she just brings out um, and dangles them in front. And, and then, you know, I'm I'm trying to be nice to people, but I, my, my patience is wearing very, very thin with the both boats SMP because mm -hmm. when they realised what they had done, they kind of slinked away, you know, and now they seem to be slinking back, you know, when the coast is clear. Um, and and then they're saying, "Oh, but Alba, Alba people are, are, are nasty to us." And I thought, "Well, if they're going to dish it out, you're, you're saying, we're not going to just sit there and take. Well, I'm not going to sit there and take it. You know, I'm fed up being nice to people. I really am. You know, I mean, I know that we were supposed to be nice to people, but no, I'm sorry. When I see Scotland being shafted, but the very part of this professed to want independence, I'm not going to be nice to people." It was like the Olympics all over again. I mean, uh, both votes SNP people created Super Saturday for the unionists. You know, <laughs> it was their ta tactics. I mean, it was like the Olympics all over again. Medals were getting handed out. None of them were coming to the independence side. They were no. all going to the union, all yes. gifted to them by these people who, you rightly say, slinked off. They were nowhere to be seen. No. And they're trying to slip back in now, hoping that everybody's forgotten. But, uh, you know, a lot of us have got long memories. They're not going to mm -hmm. slink away for this. They'll be the, reminded of it all the time. One of the, the, the things I heard was, let's all unify. Uh, no, no. Let's all not. Not until you decide, you know, you can actually see what's actually going on. You know, it's it's the worship of them. It's yeah. when you start worshiping a party yeah. and a party leader, that's when we're in trouble. Well, it's like yep. the old Labour Party. Mentioned. Sorry. Yeah. It's like the, the old Labour Party, every time they were in trouble on any issue, they called for an all party campaign. We'd all be joined together. Nobody was to have their own policy. We're all to come under this big friendly umbrella that they controlled. And then they led up the nearest dead end street they could find. And the SNP <laughs> fell for it for decades yep, until they eventually worked out, wait a minute, we'll have our own policies, we'll go our own road. And only then, only then, did Labour find the political ground slipping away from them. The yep. SNP in trouble at the moment. Let's all be pals, let's all join in. No, thank you. We'll no. have our own policies. And if you want to change, 
you're more than welcome. We'll welcome you into our tent. But yeah. we're not coming into yours to get strangled. No. no. You mentioned there, Karen, of course, that um, you've got other things in your life because you've got to keep the lights on in the house. And so, which begs the question, because a lot of our opponents of the Scottish Free Media believe that we make millions out of doing what we're doing. <laughs> no, I don't make <laughs> so, a penny. Well, you're doing your millions if you've got to take a job as well. What's going on here? Um, I don't make a, a penny for my blog. I, I don't, no, we don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, uh, I've just lost my job, to be quite honest with you. I was a support worker all through this pandemic. And... Um, do you know, Ron, we uh, had taken its toll as well, so when I when it made redundant, I, I was quite happy for a while. No, I'm not, because I'm like, oh, God almighty, these, these um, um, bills are piling up. But um, I do other things. I do other things. To kinda, you know, I'm looking at the start of my own bus. I don't know what I'm going to do right enough, but, you know, it's just a case of keeping the lights on. But I write, as you know. I, I write as well, so... Uh, you know, apart from the blog, I can, uh, as I said, I'm doing a three-part drama about the clearances. So that's in its final draft now. So I'm going to send it away out to probably Canada or something. Because I can't see it being made here. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it, we we all talked about, we did a meeting not so long ago, a Skype meeting or a Zoom or whatever. And uh, we decided to start up a free Scottish media group. Yep. Uh, and I would just like to throw something out there to people watching any kind of artistic. We could do with a we could do with a logo. We don't have a logo, have you noticed that? We don't. So we could do with a nice wee logo. So if any of you are artistic um, and you want to draw us up a wee logo, uh, do that, and then we'll uh, we'll start using it because we've got a group. There's now about ten of us in it, and I also threw out an invite to anyone else who wants to join us. There is no joining fee. There are no there's no hierarchy. It's just that we stand together and we're all fighting for independence. Uh, and over the coming weeks, I'll bring in more, more people to introduce you and introduce them to you. Uh, and I would ask you to support them because they're supporting you in the cause of Scotland. Yep. Any of you guys are testing? Me? Mm -hmm. You're you? joking. I heard you were a bit of a spray paint in your youth. No, no. Spray paint wasn't invented in my youth. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, were, we were brushes at the time. Really. Yeah. But we have, to, we have to keep the flame of independence going. We really do. Oh, I. And I know you're all working very hard and writing. And I would encourage people out there. I mean, I've got a, I'm putting out a blog for someone, the first blog ever, uh, next week. And I would encourage you to, you know, give it a go. I know a lot of you, but I mean, I was exactly the same. I hadn't written anything since I was about 16 or 17 when I left school. Um, and then suddenly you do it, and it is quite nerve wracking. But once you get going, and we need as many voices out there as possible spreading the gospel of independence, we've got to keep it going and we've got to keep the flame flickering uh, until we get well, back folk, on track. Folk need hope, you know, folk need hope. And I mean, they're going, there's a lot of frustrated people out there, a lot of frustrated people. And that frustration's only going to increase because there ain't no help coming from Butte House anytime soon. So the levels of frustration are going to build all the time. And it's important that we are there to say, look, the pressure's getting kept on them. There is an alternative strategy. We probably need personnel change, but if we all work together, we can achieve that. And I think that's the route to go. But also, ALBA will be coming out with uh, policies for independence, something that the SNP have absolutely failed to do, you know, proper policies. Uh, so we can publicise those policies as ALBA release them. They had a very good manifesto. They had good policies on the currency. They had good policy on, like, not taking the debt. So we don't have the asset share, which the, a very, the, the very good economists talked about. They have a policy on on going to EFTA. I think that we can we can start to take the ALBA policies and write about them so people can get a view of what our campaign for independence will be. Because I think our only hope for a campaign for independence is a plebiscite, an ALBA standing as the Independence Party in 2026. And so we need all those policies. But the thing is, the SM, it's not just like, so for it's not just having the policy. 
The SNP don't have the policy. They have done no policy work. They haven't produced a policy paper now probably for two years. They also haven't got the civil service working on any policies. So ALBA needs to fill that. So we have policies for a referendum. And um, but we have to communicate it to the public. There's no point in having a policy if we haven't prepared the public for it. So I think as well as blogs, I'm hoping that ABBA will do street stalls and mm -hmm. other events because the media will try and ignore them, well, try and get publicity in the media. But our blogs and maybe other methods to get across the policies of the independent Scotland so people will be ready for it when the campaign starts. One of my fears is Boris Johnson says to Nicola Sturgeon, all right, you can have a referendum in May. And Nicola Sturgeon is not prepared. He has, she has got no policies. She admits she has no policies. The economic case has to be redone. So she could not actually go into a referendum today. So Alba needs to be prepared to fight a referendum and have all the have the answers on all the there's no we haven't progressed at all since 2014. And we can't give people the same answers as we gave them in 2014. It's a different world. The, we have the EU issue, the currency issue, the pensions issue, the debt issue, the border issue. We need answers for all of them, and SMP isn't providing them, so ALBA will need to provide them. The Constitution, Scotland needs a Constitution. We have seen what happens when the government is not set up correctly and the, you di don't have proper separation of powers. We've seen how that, what kind of corruption that leads to. So we need to be have a constitution when we are independent on day one, and some, and we need to have a mechanism to create that constitution. So all these things Alba needs to do over the five years so that we can be ready to fight in 2026 for independence, and that will have to be an independence referendum. So while the SMP piss around, sorry for the language, doing nothing and lurching from one dismal failure to the next over the next five years, while Westminster attacks the parliament and takes its powers. And SM, Ian Blackford stands up every day in parliament and says Scotland will not stand for this when Scotland just takes it time and time again. When we're in that situation for five years, meanwhile, ALBA will be building the independence case and ALBA will be ready to fight in 2026. That was, now, a, that was a political party broadcast. Thank well done, you. Denise. <laughs> yeah, no, just a, to know, say that in, in, in actually, September, in September, there's an Alba conference. Um, we don't know yet the location. Um, I'm certainly going to be there. So, I hope the rest of you are. And, so, and you know, everything I've said, Alba doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to tell the conference. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know, so don't tell them. Right. So, look, Karen and Ian, can I thank you? For, for taking part tonight in the Denise show. Yep. It was yes, kind of you <laughs> uh, so uh, but I'm, I'm now going to go to the, the, the last part of our show. Um, keep on writing, Karen, and keep on fighting. We need you. Yeah. Um, and you know where we are, and we know where you are. We all stick together. Ian, yep. I'll speak to you later on, my friend, as well. Here, here come the fireworks, folks. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Um, I'm, I'm now delighted to... Uh, Welcome Eileen Spence to Through a Scottish Prism. It's the second time Eileen's been here. Last time was an, an audio show, and it's the, like Eileen. Welcome to Back to the Prism. How are you, my friend? Oh, can you hear me, Eileen? I'm good. I'm good. Good. It's uh, nice to see you. And uh, it's a joy, a joy that you're here. And you know Denise, of course. Hiya. Yeah. <laughs> so, just a quick question. I, I, what do you think about the appointment? of Shirley Ann Somerville as the Education Secretary for the Scottish Government? I think it's a bit like putting Dr Shipham in charge of palliative care. <laughs> Start as you mean to go on. That's what I say. Um, and, and what do you think she's going to bring to education? I dread to think what she's going to bring to education. I think we have a late. Oops. So, what do you think, Denise, about uh, Shirley Ann Somerville as the shadow of the Cabinet Secretary for Education? Hmm. 
Um, well, it's a friend. She's a friend of Nicola's, so that's why she got the job. It's certainly not on her ability. Um, she was quite a failure at, um, you know, she she didn't she gave back, po uh, you know, benefits. She was in social security. There were certain benefits that were that were devolved to Scotland in the Scotland Act twenty fifteen. So you know that's six years ago, and she did. She didn't. She hasn't set them up. She gave them back to Westminster, and they're actually like pip assessments and things, which are like one of the most gruesome, um, horrible experiences for Scottish people to go through. And instead of bringing them to Scotland, where we could have made it, you know, a, a, a experience with dignity for the people that have to go through them, she's left it with Westminster Tories. So having done that, she is she now moves to education so who knows i have no confidence whatsoever in shirley and somerville education and yep. um and also we have whom's at health yeah that's another joy um the joy but the other one of the joys is is live a uh, broadcast like this and we're having a few technical difficulties which is uh, not good but this what happens and who, after we lost rob i see we got another, we've lost eileen but where did you put her, Rob? I'm, I'm delighted to welcome Rob Brown of the Jaggy Blog to to the show. Nice to see you, Rob. How are you? Yes, I'm fine, Roddy. I'm delighted to be taking part in my first prism, the first of many, I hope. Well, well keep sending the checks, and I'm sure we can do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm open to bravery, you know that. You know me. You know me, Rob. But, of course, you're, uh, as I say, fairly recent to the, the blogging community and one of our members of the Free Scottish Media Group. I don't know yeah. if you heard me doing a wee uh, plug for it uh, earlier when we, we lost you and looking for someone to draw us maybe a nice logo, which would be a nice thing. Um, but yeah. you come from a journalistic background. Yes, um, I've actually a lot of experience in the Scottish press, mainly I work for the Scotsman, the Sunday Herald, Scotland on Sunday, the Independent, and... But I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of decades actually teaching journalism at various journalism schools in these islands. Um, but I would now consider myself fully a member of the fifth estate rather than the fourth estate, or what I call it in regard to Scotland at the moment, the fourth rate estate. Yeah. I suppose... I suppose we could say you're a game paper turned poacher. Yeah, possibly that's one way to look at it. But um, I think all I'm doing actually is going into what is the media of the day, really. I mean, I think the press is so 20th century, really. And what we're doing is 21st century. And, you know, I don't think it'll be long until this is really the mainstream if you like i've lost sound in you there roddy i've lost sound all right we're back <laughs> i'm right. saying it's uh, uh, the dead d press is indeed the dead tree press and it's dying daily <laughs> Um, and uh, they will stay, of course, um, but it's not going to be the same as it was in its heyday when you were starting out. No, it isn't. But one point I would make on this is I, I'm not terribly nostalgic for the so-called golden age of journalism. I don't think it ever was such a golden age. It didn't glitter all the time. I think there was a lot of lazy, non-committee journalism. And so, as I say, I'm very much living in the present producing in the present and really that seems like a previous life to be honest an earlier incarnation yeah well as you say there's no there's no glitter on them in fact that brings me to that 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 phrase you can put glitter on a jobby but it's still a jobby and that's uh, <laughs> how i would view them um, well you might put it like that Roddy. Uh, i'm not sure i would use such a well, colorful no, of course not. You, you've still got pals there i haven't i've never had any in there <laughs> and i don't want any either <laughs> um, I, I mean, I saw them up close during the election, and uh, mm. I was a wee bit in awe in the first press conference you went to. You were there as well, Denise, and I thought, "Oh, these are the these are the top guys and gals." And I tell you what, I wasn't impressed, not at all. 
Um, yeah, I mean, and they probably help to make you feel like that, unwelcome, because, you know, it has been a bit of a cabal, um, a bit of a racket, really, the media. I remember when you had to have an NUJ press card to work in the media. And, you know, I don't think there should be these barriers to anyone giving their opinions, trying to report the news or whatever. Because here's the thing, you know, journalism isn't actually a proper profession in the sense that you don't need a license to practice it like law or medicine. It's a bit more like politics or stand-up comedy. Anyone can go into it and no one's going to say, have you got the certificate or have you got the qualifications for it? And even though I taught journalism in journalism schools, the first thing I taught my students was that, you know, a degree isn't a passport into a profession because journalism isn't a profession. It's a trade or a craft. And no one should be ashamed of that. It's a fine craft if you practice it properly. Unfortunately, not many people in Scotland do, um, especially now, um, which is why we need the blogosphere, especially jaggy.blog. I'm going to put in a plug for it mm -hmm. there. Building the brand. I don't know if you can see little Jaggy behind me there. On it, the, there's an image oh, of him. Oh yeah, yeah. It's over, over your left shoulder. Over my shoulder. He's always yeah. looking over my shoulder, Roddy. Mm. Uh, uh, you must find a completely different life, though. Me lead a different life. Yeah, absolutely, a very pleasant one. I have complete editorial control over Jaggy Dot Blog, so that is a first for me. A very welcome first um, but of course that comes with responsibilities you have to be your own media lawyer um, you have to you know um, check everything you're doing there there isn't anyone to turn to for that fortunately I did not only practice or study media law but actually taught it so I probably got a bit of an advantage over some bloggers and I think that's very important in the current environment, the hostile environment. We've mm -hmm. seen what has happened to Craig Murray. I'm not going to comment much on that case because, of course, the review is underway. And I think it's a week on Tuesday. Craig will be back up in the high court to see what's happened with his appeal. Um, but I have to say, even looking at that, um, I have to say he wasn't completely blameless in how he blogged. Um, but it was certainly strange that he's the only one who's been hauled up in the high court for contempt of court, um, given that there's probably 10 to a dozen others who could equally have been accused of being involved in jigsaw identification. But we'll see what happens a week on Tuesday. Um, he's got a very good QC on his side, Ronnie Dunlop, um, so we'll see what happens, and hopefully um, it won't have a chilling effect on the blogosphere, which I suppose is the biggest worry at the moment. Yeah, I think it does, and I think that's that's a problem. And I don't think we can say that, that we have equality under law, because obviously not. The way Craig's been treated is different than the way other journalists have been treated. And that's another of our human rights that are being squashed by the government and the chilling effect is definitely happening. It's very hard to write something. I wrote a blog on freedom of expression and you know our rights and every every word I had to be careful um, just in case you know it could be interpreted differently and Humza Yusuf had the opportunity to make sure in hate crimes that we would know what was a hate and what wasn't hate, and he turned that down. So the problem is we don't know what we're allowed to write. Yeah, and did you say we're writing about hum uh, women's rights? We don't know, mm. and any of us can be. And for a I think the way they interpret, like for example, I don't use the word if I'm. If you say like I would think that person should be kicked out, I won't say kicked out just in case they'll take that as a threat of violence. Mm. So, you know, we have to watch every word. We don't have freedom of expression now. Yeah, and well, it, we, we saw what happened to Mark Hurst on that. Yes. And, and Dave. It's so quite similar. ironic, Denise, don't you think, that you were doing a blog on freedom of expression, yes. yet you thought you were 
walking through a minefield. Precisely. Um, and, and this is the crazy yet. situation we're now in. Yes. And it's partly because the judiciary is part of the government. So there's mm. always the suspicion of political prosecutions. Whether they are or not, we don't know. But the fact that judiciary is part of the government means they could be. Well, and I would... Sorry, I need to correct you on that. The judiciary, the judges aren't part of the government, but Lord Wolfe yeah. has been the Lord Advocate and he has sat in the cabinet, been the government's chief legal advisor. Yeah. And But the story today, of course, is that he's about to be replaced, yeah. whether he's right. resigning, okay. stepping down or whatever. I think that's welcome news, though. We'll see what yeah, comes after. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make the difference that we don't have separation of powers. And separation of powers is a human right in HR, human right, European hmm. Human Rights Convention, which we incorporated into law in the late 1990s. And in 2005, they sorted out the UK and they give the UK separation of powers. And that's where why Craig is able to appeal to the UK, mm. UK Supreme Court because there is separation of powers in the UK, but there's not in Scotland. Yeah. And well, I the noticed, head of sir, the Crown Office of Fiscal Prosecution Service sits in Cabinet, which does give the, the possibility of pr pr political prosecutions and prosecutions of people that are speaking out against Cabinet government policy. And that is why it's part of human rights to have separation of powers because this is what you get this is the chilling effect this is the effect yeah. of free expression which we have well, in scotland today well it's interesting that jackie bailey is quoted in the times today as calling for the two roles to be split of which of course is what some msps did in the recent Holyrood inquiry um, I think the pressure is so great for that to happen now that it probably will. But one thing I would say is that Nicola Sturgeon might be relaxed enough to do that, but only because, of course, um, Mr. Wolf uh, has served as usefulness. Um, she has survived Salmon Gate, or seems to have. She's safely back in Butte House. So I guess she doesn't have the same need for someone in that sort of dual role. Um, and again, I see that as quite cynical. It should never have happened in the first place. It was unprecedented. And you've got to ask why. Yeah, I think you also will be even worse when she appoints Rhiannon Spear as the new Lord Advocate or uh, Fiona Robertson, maybe. Yeah. Maybe they'll get a step up. You just don't know who Nicola's going to appoint. If she can go, if she, she's rigged the NEC, why wouldn't she try and rig this one? But uh, maybe Humza. How about Humza? Is the Lord? Well, advocate. he's just got the health portfolio, remember, and I don't think he'll be touching anything relating to justice for a while. I don't yeah. think the Rangers fans would like that. Well, what can I tell you? What can I tell you? Um, <laughs> yeah, Nicola Sturgeon seems to have got away with quite a lot. And that is very worrying. I can't imagine another First Minister able to survive what came out in that inquiry. The, the press and media spun it as like a matter of, oh, it was just a difference of three days. When in fact, there was there is two criminal investigations going on, one into the leak of the complainant's name and one into the leak to the Daily Record. No First Minister or previous would have survived this. So I ask myself all the time, why is she getting protected by the press? Yeah, I mean, what was interesting is, you know, the Scottish press always loves to stick the word gate at the end of everything. And Salmon Gate really did um, deserve that because in a way it was Scotland's Watergate. Um, and yet, the Scottish press, and this brings me back to what I was saying earlier and its failures, instead of grabbing this story, this wonderful drama, and making the most of it, they seemed to want it just to go away. They did. And so that they could revert again to the nice, cosy, quiet lifestyle they have. And I think they failed the Scottish public. Um and they also failed the readers, and no wonder their circulations are falling like a stone, because they don't know a good drama apart from anything else when it's standing in front of them. And actually, they called people when Salmon was 
quitted and myself and others were like there's something funny going on here how could he you know like 14 charges and they, a lot of them absolutely ridiculous um, and when we said this we were called by the journalists tin foil hat conspiracy theorists yeah mm. they're journalists they should have been finding out the truth i mean we found out quite a lot of the inquiry mm. ignoring legal advice that a first minister would have had to resign for that in the past why did she get a free pass on all this stuff that came out that's my, yeah. my wonder why do the scottish press journalists I mean, there's a picture in the, the Sunday Post the week before the election of Nicola Sturgeon carrying a baby surrounded by flowers. This is not a woman the unionists fear. This yeah, is a woman but... they're happy to keep in in her in power, and that worries me. <laughs> yeah, well, I saw actually the most scary thing I saw was a report in the National mm -hmm. about Nicola visiting some polling station. And I'm not kidding, it was like reading a report about one of the royals. And, <laughs> you know, I noticed that the National said recently that one of their 72 reasons why you should buy the National is that we don't fawn over the royals. No, that's true. What they fawn over is the First Minister and make her seem like royalty. Yeah. But um, it's not just the National. Like, that picture was in yeah. the Sunday Post. But, so... Mm. I, sorry, I hate to interrupt you, my friends, but you know, we've had a few uh, technical difficulties yeah. uh, this week. It's not been good. Rob, I'm sorry we got, it was late to get you in. No, there's uh, no problem. We've had Eileen's having a wee bit of, She's been having a few problems. We're, the show's nearing the end, and we've got to get Eileen back in again. Um, and I hope, as you say, the first of many visits, Rob. And uh, please yeah, keep, well, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, we'll just put another plug in for Jaggy. Jaggy. I do yeah, want all the following. Well, the tech, he'll run the names along there, and we'll have Wonderful. On all there. You take care, Rob, and I'll speak to you soon. All and, right, Roddy. Bye, thanks. Denise. Bye, bye, -bye. Later. Thank you. And is Eileen there, Techie? After all that, do we have Eileen back? If not, you're going to make Denise and I look kind of silly. <laughs> How are you? You want to do a bit of karaoke? What do you think? <laughs> so we have we we're, were talking about the, 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 the she's been a pal of Nicholas for uh, um uh, I see we've lost Eileen again. Um she's been a, a pal of Nicholas for, for donkey's years. And uh, as you say, she's feel wherever she's gone. Why should we think she's any different this time? Um, I, I don't know. And whom's a uh, I don't know. Words fail me. Mr. Lawson, welcome back. We're having a few technical difficulties. I'm, I'm glad you weren't already on the alcohol. Not that you drink. I know you don't drink, but I just thought I'd throw that in as a wee sort of throwaway quip. Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's just, I don't know how long I'll be here because my computer's wanting to restart. Oh, don't you start. Don't you start. Updates. <laughs> so, we have been in trouble all day today. We have been plagued with problems. I think, if nothing else, you've got to get. The, the video out there today, because we'll promise people that there was going to be fireworks in this show. Well, we still can have, but it's going to be difficult to... Uh... You know, I think, we've got to get, I think we've got to get them out there, though, because, uh, you know, we can't let the security services overcome our news. Uh, yeah. the, the news is quite devastating from what I've heard about it. I haven't seen it yet, uh, but I don't want to go to bed tonight without seeing it, so... <laughs> You know, get on to the technical department and tell oh, them we'll stay on air until they've got it. <laughs> yeah, I found, I found the problem. I found the problem, and we're, we're, we're trying to see if we can do that just now, but we've lost Eileen. Um, there are things going on in our schools, Denise. The sex education is way beyond anything, certainly in my era, the sex education took part in the playground. You know, you were told by your pa the older pals in the school, there was no set, and then they had playing things and it was uh, it got a bit more sensible shall we say when they were teaching people about reproduction and contraception and abortion and uh, but it's gone to a completely new plane now has it not it, well i believe so i mean actually ireland's an expert on this so i'm not an expert on this side of it but ireland's done a, an enormous amount of re research into the sex education at schools my understanding is it's um you know like teaching them uh, like almost like 
well i like eileen say because you know it's her well, thing i don't really i don't i don't i'm not the expert on it so well I, here's the thing we don't people. We don't have Eileen, unfortunately, yeah. due to technical difficulties. She keeps uh, crashing out. Something wrong mm -hmm. with her internet. But she gave us a couple of uh, videos that she yeah. wants to play. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they're kind of self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. And one of them is from John Swinney being questioned by parents about the sex education. So just sit back and listen to this, folks, because this is happening in a, your school with your children. You need to know about this. Please play it, Techie. And full screen if possible. Oh, thank you very much. Just before I ask my question, I'd just say to Mr. Sweeney, I think you've been put on the spot with a few individual cases. Difficult position for you, and I think you've handled that, that very sens um, sensitively. Anyway, moving on to my questions, following on from the previous question about uh, the sex education resources, and I think your answer didn't actually face up to the content of the RSHP resources. I mean, just to go through a few of the things very, very quickly. I mean, right at the beginning of primary school, teaching that sex is assigned at birth and gender is a subjective factor. I think that's a very dangerous and confusing message for young people, and yet that's what's delivered to all children in Scottish schools. The sex education materials, I'm sorry to absorb about these things, but this is what is being taught in schools. Masturbation is positively promoted in schools, in high schools, licking the anus. Remember is that we are going live out here. This is this this. I, I, okay, if this accepts, I, no, no, that this is what's being taught in schools. If this is not suitable to talk about with a group of adults, how can it possibly be suitable to talk about in schools? Yes, on the internet. Yeah, that's fine. Right. So to continue, uh, I'm not going to be stopped. So, so that's presented as a perfectly valid sexual practice. Anal sex is illustrated by a video of a banana being dipped into Nutella and then withdrawn. Pornography, uh, uh, no, 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 uh, right, pornography, uh, no, I'm going to say here, this is what's been taught in schools. Pornography is not just taught about, it is positively promoted in these materials. It is positively promoted as something beneficial and helpful. It's, Different it's genres it's of pornography it's are also it's recommended it's to pupils. So, so I'll get my question very soon. Please. I'm just referring to the resources. Mr. Swinney says he's watched them. I'm just pointing out what's in them. For example, uh, it's recommended that pupils explore, for example, facial pornography, which involves ejaculation onto the face. Oh, it's disgusting. It talks, it talks about... <laughs> Okay, what I'm talking about is what's being taught in schools. And if I'm about to get to a question, if I haven't been silenced, I'm trying to speak up on behalf of innocence and youth in our schools that's been corrupted by these materials. I will not be silenced. What's the question? And my question is. I'm not asking you to be silenced, but please. Well, where's the microphone then? I'll ask my question. Oh, okay, this situation here. Okay, this, this, this situation. I am outlining. The, I am outlining the content of the Scottish Government sex education resources. That's what I have done. I will now ask my question. My question to Mr. Swinney. These materials are not educational, they're corrupting of children. And my question is, having heard some of the detail of the content, I now invite you to re-endorse them, reaffirm your endorsement of them, as you did earlier on. Um, lastly, gentlemen's comments about uh, relationship, sexual health and parenthood. Uh, now, I accept that in this material there is some, um, there's some very sensitive territory covered. Um, and that's why I answered the gentleman's question in the fashion that I did, that I uh, appreciate there will be a range of views about whether this is appropriate material to be undertaken. A lot of care has been taken and a lot of dialogue and consultation to ensure that the contents of the material are truly age appropriate. And that has involved extensive dialogue with a number of organisations whose confidence I have wanted to make sure was in place around these materials. And one of the most significant points that has driven this debate has been what do we need responsibly to ensure young people are equipped to handle from the world that is swirling around about them. It's promoting nothing.
Uh, and there we have it. Um, that's the first time you've seen that in Indonesia, is it? Yeah, I haven't seen it before. Are you? Uh, and your, your initial reactions? Well, that's been I, taught in schools today. Yeah, and, I think it should be withdrawn because it is actually really bad for women. And um, I think girls suffer enough from the online pornography and things that are really, really unpleasant. And that's what they're teaching. And um, I. There's no pleasure for women because in anal sex because they don't have a cross chain. And therefore, it's something that men like. And I don't think we should be encouraging that. Not all men, let me please just say. <laughs> Not, all, Not men. all men. <laughs> no. But, um, just want know, to register an interest there. Think, and, and things like that is just, I can't imagine when I was, a, if I was a child and I was taught that, it was bad enough just getting the basics. I was quite, uh, I, when I learned about sex, I was quite old. I was about, 10 or 11 and i was <laughs> horrified by it really I, I really really horrified it took me a long time and that was just the basic sex can i and, just say yeah david, i, I can't imagine here. if i was listening to this stuff and, david bars just come in here and ask is this for real and the answer david is yes it is <laughs> this has been taught in schools in scotland today and, and uh, bad, the parents aren't even being told so about good. this and if you don't know that, parents, you need to get down to your school and find out what's going on. Ian, um, yeah. you're, you're the same sort of generation as me. Are you as gobsmacked as I was when I first saw that? Well, I was gobsmacked when I heard about it. I think to correct you, I think most of this programme is being introduced in 2021. Uh, I, you know, as the, the, the year goes on, teachers are being specially trained. The, the great big giveaway in that video was the enormous attempts that have been made to yeah, shut the guy down, yeah. to yeah, stop see. him from being able to voice his concerns. Yeah. That was clearly what the big worry was, because yeah. they rely on ignorance and people yeah. not finding out what that program's about uh, to get it through. Because if people do find out, and I'm speaking as a grandfather, I would be appalled if my granddaughter, who is, by the way, Denise, only 11 this week, uh, she would be appalled. I would be appalled. Her parents would be appalled if that was happening. And I wonder what the schools are doing and what's the reaction of teachers? Where's the teachers in all this? You know? But uh, you notice as well that he's going about, oh, I was consulting with agencies. This is typical of the government. The government is so incompetent. It doesn't do its own work. It shelves the work off to agencies that are captured by you know these um you know <laughs> stonewall for example <laughs> yes stonewall for example who are captured and therefore they come up with these ridiculous ideas such as the sex education why i don't know and the government just take them they just accept them because they don't think for themselves and then they justify their, their themselves by saying oh, we consulted with agencies, agencies we pay and filled with people that have no... Are, are, earning are, salaries, yeah, earning salaries for promoting. To come up with this rubbish, this yep. dangerous nonsense that we're telling children. It's yep. basically telling them pornography. Yep. Which they don't, they, you know, they shouldn't know. They don't need to know at that age. Hmm. It's but actually it really harmful to them because I just feel that it will encourage boys to take advantage of girls. That's how, what I think. Yeah. It's they can't have open it's... discussion in this. They won't allow open discussion no. in this. It's got to be hidden away. What they're trying to do is to create the Stonewall generation. And, you know, it's no coincidence that as this is happening in our schools, GRA and the hate crime yes, bill exactly. are going through Parliament at the same time. It's all part of the plan. Yes, and it's exactly. to intimidate parents, intimidate teachers from speaking out against what's been done here. Yeah, yeah. this is the, exactly the problem. And this is why the ISP and the Alaba Party and why people like us are getting attacked by the GRA zealots within the SNP and the Greens uh, and whatever else because they want to keep this secret. They don't want a debate. They don't want programs like this expressing disgust at what's going on. But at, at this forum, because unlike you, this program will not shut anyone out. So I invite anyone who believes in the GRA reforms and self-ID 
to make themselves get in touch with me. I will bring you on and we will have a discussion and you can tell us what's what's needed, what um, what rights the trans community don't have at present from the Equalities Act of 2010 that they will get from this new GRA reform and what women will gain from this GRA reform. Cynically, if you want, at the moment I'm saying women don't gain anything. They lose everything. Um, so, but the, it's an open invitation. Come and tell us about it. But it's, it's, it's also interesting that down in England, uh, this week in Germany and Sweden have pushed back on this self-identification and GRA stuff. And also the Equalities Commission in England have withdrawn their support from the Stonewall Diversity Group saying it's not diverse and it's not, it's not about equality. And we need more pushback. And it's up to you parents out there and grandparents to start pushing back because we can't do it all here on our own and nor can great people at Eileen. And I'm really sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that Eileen had such difficulties today. I'll get her back on again because she's a warrior for women and children and we will get her back. We've overrun our time because of all the wee technical difficulties that we've had, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry about that. Can I thank everyone that's participated today and Techie there in the, the back office who's been struggling quite quite heavily with all that's been going on. Um, and Ian, Denise, my friends, as yeah. always, it is a pleasure, not a chore. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. No problem. Nice Happy. to see you. Yeah, I'm glad we. I'm glad we got that out. That was needing to be publicised. Yeah, there's a uh, another couple of things. We'll maybe get, as I say, get Eileen back. We'll put them out, and it just it, they're not. They don't get better, folks. For those of you who have been watching, they don't get better. Um, but until I speak to you all again, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Let us know what you think. Um, and until I see you all again, I want you all to take care now. God bless. Bye. The Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.